We live in a fast-paced and hectic world where it's easy to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and out of control. How do you manage all the competing pressures without losing sense of yourself? How do you stay focused enough to not only plot a path, but follow it? Welcome to Master Your Life, a show that offers inspiration, insight, and intelligence, as well as success stories from many walks of life that can show you how you can control your own destiny. Our knowledgeable and entertaining hosts and their guests give practical advice that you can use every day in the quest to master your life. Now, here are your hosts, Leah Mattinson and Dr. Howard Rankin. Hi, welcome to Master Your Life, the show of insight, intelligence, and inspiration. I'm Dr. Howard Rankin, along with my wonderful co-host, Leah Mattinson. And today we have a wonderful show lined up for you. Uh, Leah, tell us a bit more. Well, I thought you were going to ask me how I was this week, and I'm fantastic. Oh, well, I, I, I always ask you, and you always say you're fantastic, so I've stopped, <laughs> I am, stopped asking you. you. I know, well, but you, you shouldn't stop, just in okay, case I change right. my mind one how day. Are one day. You? How are you this week? <laughs> I'm spectacular this week. Thanks, Howard. Okay. Thanks for asking. And I'm, I'm in particular spectacular because um, I really love the theme of what we're doing on the show today. All around the world who are, you know, doctors that are well-educated in uh, lifestyle is medicine and, you know, the prevention of things like Alzheimer's and um, just, just uh, you know, folks who are really well educated, which is great. But today what we've got is somebody who is a living, breathing example of somebody who has had a major comeback, not from one thing, but, you know, two or three things in their life and who has, who has faced the real life challenge of actually a significant health incident, a significant personal incident uh, or two. And then, you know, the, their their story of resilience and courage in coming back from that um, to be stronger really than ever. And the real life examples are hard to come by. So I'm just really excited and glad, uh, Merle, that you've joined us. So everyone, welcome Merle Morisot to our show today. Merle, thank you so much for coming and being on our show and being our guest here today. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity, the, the chance to speak. And uh, as I've been told by others, it's, it's time to openly share what has taken place. And hopefully, as you said, we, we find a way to help other people. Exactly. Right. So, Merle, you're Merle. You're not just an average Joe Schmo. You've you've got some uh, uh, technical experience, and and so can you just tell us a little bit about what, you, what kind of your background, and then where your health incidents sort of started at. Uh, my background is uh, I'm from Treaty 3 country in Grand Rapids, Manitoba, and my grandparents uh, were part of the Manitoba Hydro Project, and I'm going way back just before I get to the technical part of things. Uh, the Manitoba Hydro Dam was being built. There was 1,500 Aboriginal people there, and at that time, the influx of people ranged between five and 7,000. So my grandfather took me out, and we're talking, and he looked at me and says, you know, there's a lot of really good people in this world because mm -hmm. within this isolated community, he was suddenly exposed to people from all over the world, right? And he says, don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget there's a lot of really good people in this world. I went, you're right. And then he looked at me and he took my, my hand, eh? and his thing was always my boy. Every time he used the words my boy, he knew it was going to be a compliment. Eh? And he says, you know, my boy, remember this. As long as you care for others, they'll care for you. And I looked at him and said, yeah, as long as you help others, they'll help you. As long as you give, you will receive. And he says, don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that if you can find a way to help people, you've done the right thing. Hmm. So fast forward to uh, into the technical world. Um, I've got a curiosity or had a real curiosity. I think I still do for just about too many things. So <laughs> I decided... <laughs> I'm graduating from high school. My English teacher, she looks at me, we're dancing. And I'll never forget this. She says, you know, one of these days, you're going to decide to do something other than <laughs> just look cute. <laughs> and be a bit of a, you know, and I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, this is, this is an inspiring message. And she says, and once you decide what you want to be, she says, trust me, you're going to be really good at it. She says, I just don't know what it is. You know, she says everybody else had a, a place, right? So I ended up going to Nate, sorry, to, to SAIT, and I became a gas plant technologist working in gas plant processing plants. I then moved over to power engineering, 
and got half of my second class power engineering degree. And then I moved, uh, because the job was part of it, I moved into industrial firefighting and municipal firefighting. And with NFPA, mm-hmm. went from a firefighter to an on-scene commander. And then somewhere in there, I thought, okay, you're getting up there. It's time to look at retirement. So I went to U of A, looked at occupational health and safety, and began doing that type of work with auditing. So prior to the heart attack, um, I had four functioning careers, and I was training first aid and CPR, St. John's, things like this, and just, again, doing a lot of volunteer work. And, again, just sort of hopefully – maintaining the, the you know the goal of simply helping others right and then june 11th 2016 yeah life changed <laughs> i was participating in the ms bike ride and um the oh, sorry you know i've said this so many times i do the same mistake over and over again it's it's interesting it's like it's entrenched but i was up in fort mcmurray and uh got evacuated three times prior to the MS bike ride. So my chest was somewhat congested. I didn't feel that, you know, like I was just right, but, you know, like the MS Society, I've been part of that group for four years and really believed that I got people that are MS, you know, uh, they have MS symptoms, things, and thought, yeah, I got to find a way to support, right? So I was doing the bike ride. I came up a hill and my chest got really sore, really sore. Like it just, like, there's a lot of pain here. The guy that I met, he looks at me, and says, uh, and we're starting to talk. He goes, okay, Merle, I got a question to ask you. If you were standing here looking at a guy, 55 years old, with chest pain, that kind of looked like he fell off a bike, what would you do? So that's send him to the hospital. He goes, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's just send you to the hospital to make sure, right? So get in the vehicle, and I literally walked into the hospital with my bike over my shoulder. Okay, Like literally walked in there. There's this young lady. She looks horribly, horribly bored. (laughs) <laughs> and then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, her eyes just literally just pounce open, and she runs. The next thing I know, this, this whole activity starts taking place, and I'm surrounded by people. And I'm not sure what's going on, because really, in my mind, I know I'm in the hospital. I've learned to calm my body down. I've learned to just breathe and just kind of take things in, you know, just allow to take away the craziness, right? So finally, I just asked, I said, um, what's going on? And the lady looks at me and she goes, uh, you got a valve 100% blocked in your heart. Nope. I'm like, oh, okay. But my eyes are open. I'm still cognitive. I'm still aware of what's taking place. I'm, I'm all these things. And believe it or not, I said, well, can you guys just unclog the heart? So I got to go finish this bike ride. <laughs> <laughs> to which they said, sure, we'll do that. And we'll get you back uh, on yeah, your bike so- so it, it um, we got into that. They got me to the ambulance, and there's no good time to share bad news. Mm-hmm. There's no good time to prepare people. It just doesn't exist. So I've got <laughs> I've got my cell phone. I'm being taken to the Matsenkowski. I've been told I'm having a critical heart attack. I don't really know why this has taken place, but I've been told. So I send out this all message via text to my mom, my daughter, friends, family, basically saying I was in the MS bike ride. They're claiming that I got a valve 100% plugged and I have to go to the hospital. So you guys have a great day. Love, Merle. Send. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. No filter. <laughs> not, not at all. I, and then the attendant and I, we were talking, and the last thing I remember is saying to him, I'm in good hands. I'll be okay. And I lose cognitive memory for two to three weeks, depending on who you talk to. You know, like it just, there's nothing there. I get to the, the hospital, and the rest, what I'm telling you now, sharing with you is what other people have told me. Get to the U of A. Uh, Dr. Patterson is there. He checks. He goes, yes, it's probably the best place of the valve to be plugged in your heart. He says, you know, and I'm wide awake. I'm asking good questions. We're talking. I get to see the stint go up. I feel the release of pressure, things like this. Uh, the next day, I posted a picture on Facebook and basically said, you know, this could happen to anybody. Because prior to this, I was actually training to climb uh, uh, Aconagua, which is 26,000 feet. So I was in pretty good shape. I was pretty mm-hmm. strong and pretty healthy, pretty active, right? All these things are taking place. I have phone calls. I have conversations. My mom called me every day just to make sure that I was okay, all this stuff. Right? Like it was just, and nobody 
nobody knew that I was on automatic memory. Like there was nothing mm. there other than I was just a little bit slower, obviously not as strong because really you don't have that type of event and your body comes right, right back. Eh? And uh, <clears throat> I don't remember any of it. You know, I don't remember anything. I was not allowed to drive. I was not allowed to lift anything heavy, things like this. And it was just, you know, I had my grandkids around playing with them. It just wasn't as active, which all kind of made sense. I have no recollection of anything. And then Saturday night, um, we were sitting outside. And what I got told is it seemed like I was getting dizzier and it just seemed to be lightheaded. And I walked up the stairs and simply said, ah, I'm tired. I gotta go to sleep. You know, it was a big day for, for whatever reason. And uh, walked up the stairs, got to the second landing, which is literally right behind me. I slipped, fell, hit the wall, and my heart stopped for 14 minutes. That's what took place. Um, they're not sure. They're not sure how long I laid there because um, the guy that kind of kind of found me was a little bit. Um, he was into his own video world. He also had the headphones on, things like this. He said he heard a loud bang, eh? And you know, like right now I'm five ten, two hundred fifteen, two hundred eighteen pounds, this type of thing. And you know, you have that type of weight hit the ground. It makes a loud bang, right? Right. Yes. So, and so he came upstairs, seen me. And at this point, I'm going into you know, everything else. With it, but phone calls made because of the heart attack. I was actually given nitroglycerin. So the you know the former companion, she literally lifted the type of thing, which actually increased the amount of oxygen into my body. And because of um, my training and everything else like this, I've actually got a large lung capacity, heart capacity, and, and they started CPR between the three of them. Um, you know, if that was taking place and, 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 you know, and I wasn't projecting this, okay. I wasn't not projecting this, but when I bought the house in Sherwood Park, being a former fire captain, I always looked to see how close the fire department is, <laughs> the police, oh. things like this. I checked for these things because I think if there's an emergency, I want you to come and save me as fast right. as possible. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> so it's on my list of things. Like, I just, I have to have this. There's just this whole thing. If you're going to, we all get into trouble, okay? And mm -hmm. if you put yourself in a position where you could get good help, you get it. So Fire Hall Sticks is um, maybe six minutes away, you know? So, I mean, and all this was all after. So they, they came in. I read the report, which is really, uh, like, you know, because I've been doing this type of work. But to actually hear, read, that you've coded it mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean that's that's one of the things like even on my above my fridge i have this, the green pamphlet saying that something happens it's it's all there like you have to go and check these things right and somewhere within that they got my heart going again i found out afterwards that my heart stopped three or four times like within uh, 48 hours uh, they put me into a coma and and again i don't obviously i don't know but this, what I've been told is anywhere between three to four days that I was in an induced coma. And then they said to me, well, it's um, like the total family and friends were bringing him out. But with the amount of oxygen he did not have to his brain, we need to tell you that chances are he's never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Right. But his heart is stabilized. And now we have to know what the damages are. So they brought me out and... Uh, I started coming to and things like this and people could quickly see that like this conversation we're having right now, if I had the same conversation, then I'd be looking at you, Leah going, and your name is, and your name is, right. and your name is, and your name is. And I was just repeating the same thing. I couldn't retain. And the doctor told the family said, this may be the way it is for the rest of his life. Like what you're seeing now is really what, what could be taking place. Right. So, mm -hmm. so you go from this very active, vibrant man to uh, just simply repeating himself. I mean, they started calling me Dory. You know, that, that was like, yeah, <laughs> so always trust the family to come up with the black humor to deal with stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. I mean, like, oh, just like Dory, but not as cute. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So, so that was taking place. <sighs> And then one morning at uh, 
It was about three o'clock in the morning. I woke up. I woke up like all of a sudden I looked around and what I seen is I seen the hospital room. I seen all the attachments that were to my right, all the attachments to his left, this tremendous amount of pain and, and pressure on the side of my chest. And I looked around and my mind simply said, you're in a hospital. Hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out where or why. And I, all of a sudden it was just like, I can remember being in the ambulance. And I said to myself, because I grabbed this, I said, Merle, you got shot. Oh. That was a thought that went through my head. Right. That I got shot in the chest. It might have been somewhere in the accident, things like this, because I couldn't figure out why I had all this stuff. Eh? Mm -hmm. And I remember the attendant saying to me, just go back to sleep. You're tired. I'm like, okay. So I wake up that morning, and the the thing that's taken place is that because everyone suspected or knew that there was already brain injury, people talking, they were talking around me and they were not talking to me. Okay. Because really why bother that you knew that I wasn't going to remember. Right. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the nurse, she was talking and I simply said to her, if you're going to talk about me, talk to me, I don't appreciate this. Mm -hmm. And she stopped and she just stared at me and she looked at my daughter and she says, uh, your dad's starting to come back, you know. Excellent. Yeah. And then after that, uh, yeah, it was, um, there was a lot, eh? like there was a lot that took place that like after, you know, and, and um, I'm not sure where to go right now, Leo. I, I don't yeah. I'm not exactly sure where you want to go with this. But, yeah. Well, no, obviously, uh, you you had some severe impairments so the question would be how have you managed to recover so well from um, being somebody who was barely out of a comatose state mm -hmm. um i'm sure your cognitive functions weren't working your your attention your memory or all of those things what's what has been that recovery like because you know, listening to your story, you're clearly a very fortunate guy, um, right? Um, so most people but don't. For, fortune, fortune favors the prepared also, though, because, yes, you had, because of your training, you also had, like you said, expanded lung capacity. You were in pretty good shape, which we've talked about quite often on this show, is that you have a much better chance of recovering from anything if you're in good shape. Um, so it's it's not just fortune. It's that you and you also had this profession where you were where you were drawing on. Um, auto, like automatic sort of thinking because of the habituated patterns of thinking of exposure to incidents that you had already had yes. in your life. So you, you had all that, then it's amazing that you were able to retrieve some of it from somewhere. <laughs> that, was, that was the part that just amazed me later on is the power of automatic memory. Because like mm -hmm. during my career, I would respond, but I'll, I'm not going to say I was 100% in the correct response. Right. But I am going to say that I was 99% correct in my responses. Okay. And when I made a mistake, like there was significant impact. It, could, it was right. that fast because the information would come in. I put it all together that quick. I would respond because, you know, like in a gas processing plant, refinery, upgrade, you're dealing with people's lives, you know, yeah. which, which includes making a decision right now. So I'd pull it in, boom. And if I wasn't sure, I just shut the complex down. I'm the only guy that's ever evacuated the Shell Scottford complex. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> and people who have not listened or who don't know what Shell Scottford is, um, maybe you could give a little snippet so that they would understand that, what, what Shell Scottford is. The Shell Scottford complex is a combination of a chemical plant, a refinery, and an upgrader, and also a power plant. So at the time when I evacuated the whole system, there was uh, 7,500 people on site. Wow. And all said and done, the management team sat, we talked, they said, yes, you're absolutely right. It was the right call, right decision, everything there. There was no challenge on it. But of course, it was right. the whole fear, and then which then led to those people there saying, how did you see this? So now mm -hmm. that's where the difficulty is. How did you see it this quick? You know, right. and like it just, it just, things just kind of fell together. That mm -hmm. being said, post heart attack, it took me a long time to figure out how to make a peanut butter jam sandwich. Like it, it took mm -hmm. uh, it took me yeah. a while 
because I couldn't find the bread, I couldn't find the peanut butter, I couldn't find the jam, I couldn't figure out how to actually put it in the toaster properly, and then if it didn't come out, how was I going to get it out? I knew that I had to plug it in, and I had to unplug it, and where that would take, you know, five to six minutes, and finally I'd have a nice cold peanut butter and jam sandwich. <laughs> But I got and to, so right? damn satisfying, right? Oh, right. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. So, so, so you have, um, so you have the professional side of you that was able to respond to this, uh, the, you know, this critical incident. You had good care in the hospital to help you to recover, but you, you're not just a, uh, and you had a partner at the time who yes. helped a little bit, but things were shifting in your personal life also, and so. So this incident happened about three years ago, right? Is that right, Merle? About, yeah. So three incidents, oh three God. years ago. Yep. Oh, yeah. So then hmm. going, it, it's one thing to tell the story in the context of just the incident, because that sounds like, okay, well, it's easy. You just can fix that because it's just you and your heart and a bunch of doctors. But in the context of real life, um, you didn't just have the peanut butter and jam sandwiches to make. Oh. You had people to take care of. And you had a relationship, and you had other things that happened earlier that influenced um, your ability to cope with really difficult times. So I, I don't know what part you want to share about all of that stuff, but you you can decide what you'd like to share about the, those things. The uh, my trauma therapist and I talked about this, and I've also talked to a few priests about this, just so that just understand because there was mm -hmm. there were some major powerful things that took place that really bottled my only son. And uh, he was 27. Seven years ago in July, I lost my only son. And uh, he was 27. And he had two little kids. And um, within the first two, three years, like there was his partner was very sporadic. And the way it ended up is that um, I got asked by her mom, the grandmother, to actually take them. She simply said, if we allow them into care, you may never see them again. Mm -hmm. so I said, yeah. No problem. You know, so we'll go in and sign the papers and everything else like this. And all of a sudden, you talk about full-time dad again, right? You know, these two grandkids that are also dealing with the loss of their dad, you know, and of course, yeah. dealing with the loss of my son. And all those things are taking place. And I worked with a, a lady called Kim LeBlanc. She, um, she was from Soldier and Wellness. And, and we spent probably about two and a half years. And, and she, like everything is, is hindsight, you know. But she mm -hmm. predetermined the amount of stress and baggage that I was carrying was not healthy for me. Mm -hmm. She just looked at me and she goes, this is not normal. And I, I'm not getting into the things that happen as a child and things like this yeah. and all this other stuff. I'm only going, I'm sort of stopping at my son. And she looks, she says, Merle, your average person doesn't have these things and able to move forward. I said to her, I, I said, but I said, I go back to core values simply saying, as long as I'm trying to help somebody, I'm doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I just keep that and don't lose sight of that, then I'm doing the right thing. You know, and so somehow I'll get there, right? And so we spent, you know, she's, she actually taught me how to talk again, is what she did. Because mm -hmm. I just, you know, like when you lose a child, you, you go into a terrible, dark place, you know, and it could just, um, I was publicly speaking, but privately not saying a thing. So it wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't doing the right things at all. So she really helped with that. And then when I died, uh, sorry, prior to the heart attack, a uh, former companion and I were already talking about parting ways. I and mean, when she, uh, she had some teaching things that she wanted to do and some professional things and other things else like this. And unfortunately there were some mental health issues with her kids that just were starting to escalate. It was just everything that could go and go wrong for a relationship was taking place. And we didn't want to be mean to each other. So it was like, how do you move forward in a healthy way, right? And then I had the heart attack. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> But um, what happened, like I said, during the, the cognitive loss, I only have one memory. Only one memory of during the two weeks. And there, there are three weeks, whatever it was. Um, I remember my eyes open. I remember seeing a silver blue door and the door opens and my son steps up. He's wearing a pair of uh, nice jeans, nice shirt. Uh, he always had really nice hair, 
So mm -hmm. it's always just nicely done. And he always had this million dollar smile. So right away, as soon as he walked in the room, I mean, like, you know, there he was. So like, like, you know, when he walked in, when he left, it was a vacuum. Like he was just simply, he was very outgoing, very personable. The girls loved him. I mean, I'm just like, you know, they stopped. and like, oh my God, look at him. <laughs> like it was just, so he comes running to me, dad, dad, and we're talking telling things he's telling me about where he is i'm telling him about where i am i'm telling him about the kids i'm telling him stuff and it was just this overwhelming emotion and he says i'm good i'm good dad i'm good you know and, and then he takes my hands and he simply says dad you promised me you would look after my kids mm -hmm. and i could feel myself going yeah i gave you my word i gave you my word that i would look after your kids you know and he says, okay, make sure that every day you tell them that I love them. Yeah. You make sure that you tell all the people I love that I love them. Yeah. And I remember him kissing me on the cheek steps to the door, turns and smiles and says, okay, see you later. The door closes and I wake up. That's the only memory I have. So I'm talking with uh, my therapist. We talked about this and she says, do you realize that by sharing the story honestly with people that you may bring another family, a mother or father, you know, whoever may be a little bit of peace and joy in their lives because they know the person they love has crossed over they're healthy. They're waiting. They haven't lost you. It's just, it's just space, right? So that I hung on to dearly when I started to actually come out of this whole thing. Because eh? I said to myself, there's my two grandkids. Mm -hmm. I can't be flipping out. I can't be doing things that are going to upset them. Yeah. I have to try and be as normal as I can, but I also have to be as honest as I can, you know, to try and just help them what is taking place. And then, uh, unfortunately, five months after the heart attack, my former companions, two oldest, decided, ah, oh, they're going to beat me up and kick me out of my house. So, it just, uh, yeah, well, she didn't like men. She decided she hated all men. And she'd been like that for years. So was her daughter. And the boy, well, you know, he basically, unless if he was in complete control of everything, which, as we all know, nobody ever is. <laughs> That's <laughs> decided, right. Yeah, so he decided that, yeah, it was time. So, you know, and they're both in their thirties, this type of thing. So, so I got healthier. I got stronger. They left. I mean, I've said that I said this to them both. I said, you know, if you're going to take that path with me, mm -hmm. make absolutely one hundred percent sure I never get up. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a smart thing to do. Right. I've, I've been part of things that have taken place that you know they're just ugly, but it's also mm -hmm. part of survival. It's part of this, you know, and it was just like. Okay, so now all of a sudden I've got myself, these two beautiful kids, um, raising them. So I thought to myself, okay, what do I got to do? I knew that I'm not right. I knew I'm getting better at peanut butter and jam sandwiches. Like, <laughs> like, like, like a thing to say. But I also had a life of repeatability where, you know, like even this morning, like, you know, like I do the exact same things I've been doing for the last three years that I can recall before talking with you folks. It's the exact same thing. It doesn't change because I need that, that consistency to set my day. And I was doing this prior to the heart attack, right? It's the same thing. I like, I go to work and um, uh, I, I've got some statements about that I've said to people that really weren't nice. I'm not really famous for it, but I am. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. And one of them was I'd walk into work and there'd be this whole cup up full of stuff like this. I, and like, I said, you realize that activity is the illusion of accomplishment, right? Hmm. <laughs> and once they understood me, it was like, I hate you. <laughs> That's why you keep saying I'm retired. You must hate me. He's like, no, no. <laughs> I'm learning not to say that one too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi gang, Leah Mattinson here. You're going to want to get out a pen and paper and take down this link address. It's bit.ly slash hocmyl. 
That's bit.ly slash health on command master your life. Now you might wonder, why do I want to take that down, Leah? Well, I'm going to go against the grain here. Be candid and make a bold statement. Spending months and months to look and feel amazing is a complete waste of your time. And we can prove it. Our clients are finally dropping stubborn weight and getting in the best shape of their lives, even if they're always busy and don't have time to go to the gym or to get on the next diet plan. And how would you like us to personally walk you through the exact game plan that helps our clients to lose up to 20 pounds in 30 days, get in great shape, have unshakable confidence from the boardroom to the bedroom, and help me to lose over 100 pounds 20 years ago and keep it off absolutely for free? All you need to do is to go to bit.ly slash H-O-C-M-Y-L. That's bit. Dot Lee slash health on command master your life. So what I what what I knew is that I needed help. Yeah. I needed help. I needed I needed the, the honesty of help. I needed the care of compassion of people. I needed to be able to honestly come forward and talk to people and say, I need your help. So all of a sudden I went from very, you know, and if there's an uh, emotional fault that I carry, I'm extremely independent. Right. And, you know, and people like to hear that, but, you know, like interdependent is the goal. It's not being independent. (laughs) So I started reaching out to the school and I simply said to the teachers, the principals, uh, the people at Glen Allen, uh, the people at uh, the daycare, I said, if at any point you see me falter, at any point you see me not be the same, inconsistent, you see things that are impacting the kids, I want you to shake the cage, tell me black and white what's mm-hmm. going on. You have to tell me these things. And to this day, I'm not good with being subtle. If you like me, simply say you like me. If you like that I did this, simply say you do it, okay? If you, you don't, would like this, tell me. It's really, it's not emotional to me. It's simply respecting you as a human being. That's what it is. Like, I, I function better there now. So... So getting help was a huge part of this, getting help just to actually sit and, and, you know, and and finding these these people that were prepared to help. So, You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, probably we don't realize is that we are constantly training our brains uh, in many different ways. And you've had that opportunity almost to reprogram them. And it strikes me that given the nature of who you are, of the things you've done, your resilience uh, and so forth, that you have been able to do that very well. Um, you know, you talk about structure, you talk about routine, you talk about doing the same, same sorts of things every day. And, I think in your case, that probably is hugely valuable, certainly has been up to this point, uh, because it's the repetition that allows your brain to get into that habit and then sort of run more on automatic pilot without Mm -hmm. you having to think about everything you're doing, which I'm sure at the beginning of your recovery, when you had that capacity, was very wearing, right? Oh, I I was going to the Glen Rose and... um I couldn't, I couldn't follow conversation, but I could see the emotion of people and the indifference of people, which really, and all of a sudden you, you show up at a bus stop, eh, and uh, you take a look around and there's like 90% are indifference to why you're there. A couple are there, mm-hmm. and yourself, am I supposed to be here? Mm-hmm. You know, like the, the whole body language of how people talk to each other. And, want to speak to each other it it got really scary because i wasn't sure that all of a sudden like i'd be looking at people and thinking they're blending they're not Mm -hmm. unique but they're all kind of one and and i've got told afterwards that was my mind separating emotions separating physical structures separating these things because we all have these common features where before i took them for granted like i was like uh, you know just just do my thing right but uh, but the Glen Rose, I mean, like the, the amount of work that was done there, just for me to understand, like it was a lot, you know, because like even catching a bus there, <laughs> I don't know where the story just came from, but I got told to get on the number eight to get to the Glen Rose, okay? Mm-hmm. So I got on the number eight. The thinking was, in my mind, 
well, if I get on the number eight at the Glen Rose, they'll take me home. And I ended up in Millwoods. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great bus ride. I'm like, yeah, I'm not supposed to be home an hour ago. <laughs> just, and it eventually would have got back to the Glen Rose, right? <laughs> right. Just stay on the loop. Stay on the loop. I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, this is all working out well, eh? but uh, but the amount of work that they've done and how they explained automatic memory and how they explained where where things are happening, eh? and one of the big questions I kept on getting asked was, okay, what were you doing prior? And I said, well, you know, uh, non-drug user, non-smoker. Occasionally, I have the odd cigar, uh, light drinker, very physically active, things like this, and I was always trying to learn things. And like I said, those are core things that they're finding now is that if you're not doing these things, you walk into this and how do you restart, right? Where I was still just repeating the same things that I was doing as a child, you know, and I didn't realize that. I mean, it just, just went along with it, right? But the Glen Rose, like I said, the, the amount of work they do and, and the part about a brain injury is denial. You know, like, I mean, it, it, it's just complete denial because... Physically, I started looking like myself by January. Mm -hmm. you know, started me that you couldn't see the, the loss of, of, of strength. You couldn't see these things, and but when you started talking to me, you could see you know like the Dory look was there, just kind of going off, right? And it um, we were sitting out in the field. I just got to remember this correctly. There was these three young men that were all missing a body part. And it was either a hand, a foot, or a leg, or something. There was something, but they're all hanging out, okay? And uh, they're, you know, and now, of course, because marijuana is legal, I can comfortably say this, but they're yeah. sitting in the field, you know, smoking marijuana in front of the, the, the rehab center and everything else. They got their wheelchairs and all this other stuff, right? And, um, and they're laughing, just giggling. And I'm thinking, you know, you lost a hand. I mean, I'm not going to judge you on losing a hand if marijuana makes you happy good job you know and um so all of a sudden they stopped they stopped talking and i looked over and like and you could see all three young guys are now looking over to the right okay and do you remember selma hayek from desperado yes mm -hmm. yeah okay. there's this young lady walking up is almost like identical to selma hayek from desperado now there's these three guys no shirt, missing limbs, things like this. Chest comes up a little bit. The one guy does his hair. They put on the big smile, and she looks at them, and she giggles. And it's just this nice, real sweet, flirtatious thing. And I'm looking at this, eh? And, uh, and of course, she just kind of goes off, and the guys are just following her, like, prettiest girl they've ever seen in their entire life, you know? And they're just, just tickled, right? And I put my head down, and I looked up, and the one young man that had a hand missing is holding his joint, he says, just remember and never forget this. We're broken. We're not broke. Mm -hmm. And I just stopped, eh? And it was like this moment of, yeah, okay, I can I can find a way. You know, and of course the wife would have never seen them again, right? But and that's okay, because you know the impact is what he told me was Right. So, so funny how those things show up over and over and over again, right when you need them, the little reminders to oh. just keep keep going and and continue on. There's a couple things, Merle, that I think uh, for that struck me uh, about the the story. Well, we talk about in our uh, health and command programs about being well and that it's so important to be well before an incident happens, uh, and that at any stage of life you can. Uh, get rolling again. It doesn't matter if you're overweight by 10, 20, 30, 40, 80 pounds, whatever it is, or you've had a sedentary lifestyle, but it, you can start really anytime. Um, so that's, you know, number one, and you can get prepared anytime. You don't have to have started in childhood. But the, the thing that really struck me in your story and that resonates for me is this whole idea of being alone in your, uh, you know, that not being alone, because who do you talk to? Um, or, and how do you talk to them and what's okay to talk about when you've got something um, that is, well, two things, you've got a, you know, a loss and you, then you've got this brain thing that nobody can see. So you look perfectly fine. Everything's perfectly fine. You look perfectly fine. And then people assume that you're perfectly fine because you look perfectly fine. And so how do you, 
you know, how do you connect to people um, and talk to them about that, uh, that maybe you're not and, and have people in your corner that you can trust that are going to tell you when everything's not okay, because that's, I've looked at people over the past 10 years since I've known my genetic status and gone, I will make a decision about whether or not I want them in my life because I'm gene positive for Huntington's, which has all these wonderful features that can include being, um, you know, paranoid, delusional, angry, all, like just tons of stuff. And so I thought, man, if I lose it with my kids when they were little, who's going to, who's going to say, well, she's raging. She's this raging, you know, person because of the disease. Who can I trust that would actually say that? Who would look at the kids and protect them? Uh, and then who can you bring in that you trust um, to help you make good decisions or that you trust with your bank account or you trust with your heart or any of those things? Like it's a very interesting uh, place to be. So with your story, it resonated with me because I went there. We're not the only ones who are sitting in that boat going, hmm, I wonder, you know, how you extend trust to people. And, and then who do you talk to and how do you tell them? And for myself, because of the situation was taking place, I mean, I, I, I talked to Dr. Braxton. She was the psychologist at the U of A. Yeah. And simply very blunt, and she was very blunt with me and simply said, these are the things you have to do. Uh, at a personal level, I mean, uh, I became, I'm not going to say a burden, but I put a lot on my daughter and yeah. I put a lot on my mom because they became the regular people that I would talk to every day, you know, this type of thing. And then somewhere along the line, and I don't know how this happened, I really don't know, but I really started to find myself boring. I'm like, we're having the same conversation over and over again. This is boring. Right? Like, right. Be a little bit more entertaining than this. They so try and do something, you know, add some value to the conversation. I mean, just. <laughs> <laughs> It's all, you know, it's, it's all relative, though. You know, compared yes. to not being able to have a conversation at all, a boring conversation is an upgrade, right? Oh, so yeah. you're, you're part of your progress. But because I said to myself, I'm boring, I thought, okay, well, what do you do? Well, if you're boring, I'm not going to ask you two to entertain me. I'm going to entertain me. Because we right. share being entertaining. You know, mm -hmm. like, it has to happen, right? So I started doing more things. I started getting involved with things. I started doing outdoor bike riding. I started doing other things to actually say that I'm, I'm functioning. I'm doing stuff. I mean, it wasn't to where I was, but it was still something to do, you know, something just to go out. I mean, I lost my license for almost a year because they wouldn't let me drive. Right. And so I took up uh, outdoor winter bike riding. I'd go to the store with that. I, have, I still have them. I hop on my bike. I go get my groceries, walk around, come back. It's all good, right? You know, so I just do these things. And as I got stronger, I found that um, because my memory loss was so huge that I was doing word puzzles at a grade one to three level for about three months. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and and maybe Howard, you could, this is something more in your, your both of your alleys, but it, I think what took place is that I got my core back in math skills and problem solving. Mm -hmm. Once I got it back, mm -hmm. then I could actually get bigger right. problems. I could actually see things. Yep. But I had to go back to these foundational items. And if I right. didn't get them, and all of a sudden one day, like I, and, I can, and, I've, and I've said this layout, but I mean, it just um, all of a sudden have complex issues just sort of hit me. And it makes sense. Right. Yeah. Three, you know, I could, I, could burn yeah, I think you do have to go back to the beginning and do the basics, kind of re refresh your memory, as it were, that probably has uh, been impacted by the trauma. And you, and it's not going to take you long. It's not going to take you, you know, three years to do it, but it's going to take you a few months, and then gradually you build up those skills again. Yes. And you learn what, you know, you learned as a kid, you learn it a lot quicker, but you need to go through that because it had been at least masked, if not wiped out. Yeah. Um, and so that's what you've had to do. And you've done a fantastic, amazing job of doing that. But as Leah points out, and as you point out, you were able to do that, A, because of all the things you did before this, which kept you in as good a shape as possible. And secondly, clearly you've been willing to do the hard work now to recover yeah. the function. Well, the part that's really difficult with the brain injury, you know, is that 
there's moments like even right now, I feel like Merle Morsel pre heart attack is right beside me. Why? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You don't do what he did and not be very, very critical. Mm -hmm. Because I was mm -hmm. almost very critical of myself. I would not try and harm other people. I would not try and I'd always try and find a way. But because it was me, I don't mind just say whatever I want to me. <laughs> you know I mean? like, right. Get over it, you know. Come on, bro, we'll just do this stuff. So that's been the real most difficult part. So because that person was watching, and it just seemed like it, it just wasn't good enough. That I had to somehow learn to make mm -hmm. peace with myself and say, no, 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 no. You're you're not doing this. You you got to be kind to yourself. You got to look after yourself. You got to be caring for yourself. And I think I was even trying to do that with myself before. It's just, you know, like just how do you problem solve, right? So that's been a huge challenge just to kind of bring those two people back together. Mm -hmm. You know, and at the same time, you know, when I make mistakes, mm -hmm. I make mistakes. I forget, I forget. It's not the end of the world. You know? <laughs> and that gets back to support. I got, I got a lot of friends that are 55 plus. Right. And I, and this is a horrible <laughs> joke, okay? This is a horrible joke. It's terrible. But I've got these guys that are looking at me saying, you know, I'm telling my wife, i got a brain injury. That's why I'm not forgetting these things. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Let's forget everything. Don't worry about it. It's a big deal. So even as we're aging, the ones who's group of people, we're mm -hmm. starting to share the memory loss. It's okay. It happens. You know, it's not detrimental it's not the end of the world we just got to find a way to kind of help each other out and look after each other and, and the circle's gotten like a, a lot tighter and it's gotten simply a lot more supportive and helpful and i thought to myself maybe i was always there i just didn't realize it because i was always doing so much work i don't know you know but it's just it was just allowing other people to help me right which is really it's just been very mm -hmm. very good so we've only got a couple minutes left merle what what's your biggest thing that you would mm -hmm. Um, love to tell people that are facing any kind of situation where they are looking at being resilient. Or what do you think is the core th lesson or piece that you would want people to take away from this interview? Uh, there, there'd probably be a couple things. Like I said, I did a, a bunch of work with doc Dr. Indira Gajra. She's a trauma therapist. Mm -hmm. And she spent a lot of time talking about meditation, breathing, stretching, allowing mm -hmm. your mind to settle you know, dealing with the anger at that moment. I mean, I used to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning just very, very upset. Now, I sleep through the night. It's no big deal, right? Okay. So she really taught me how to actually go through those levels of grief to actually say, okay, this is the things that you have to do. She also said to me, you need to create your own prayer. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, she says, you need to be able to say something every morning that affirms that you're important in this world. So every morning, you know, I, I made or I had a friend of mine make this plaque where it simply says, you know, I believe in love, I believe in hope, I believe in faith, I believe in kindness, I believe in us. And underneath it is the date of when I died. And mm -hmm. then from there, I just simply say, these are the people that I believe in. And at the bottom of that, I simply say, I'm surrounded in love. And mm -hmm. that every morning I say that and I think about each of these people think about the kindest things that they've done for me and just give them nothing but the best. You know, and that, that to me is a huge part of this is just make sure again, like as you've said in your, your shows, you know, like you set your day off in a positive light, it's in positive light. So mm -hmm. every morning it's, it's, it's just become normal and uh, become very healthy. Yeah. So and there's no, and there's no better way that we could end the show. So if, if, if you didn't write that down, you should probably get a pen and paper out and rewind the, you know, the last minute and take a, take a note of, for yourself of, you know, what would your morning prayer sound like? What would it be like? And Merle, it's just been an absolute delight to have you on. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it will resonate with so many people who've had real life Mm -hmm. trauma and also to give people a couple of other key lessons one being take care of your health now because it's that important yeah. to be prepared to be prepared for things and um and that you can get help um from your neighborhood uh you know fire department you can get help from therapists you can get help from great trainers and great coaches and if you're looking for help in the health department you can look out reach out to us at health on command um our closed Facebook group and get connected with Howard and I and Merle, thank you again for your time today. We love you so much. 
Take that into the world. Have a great week, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for being a part of our program today. Master Your Life with Leah Mattinson and Dr. Howard Rankin has been a presentation of Real Life Training, Inc. Join us next time on Master Your Life, helping you to discover the very best of you.